Uh, today's presentation is a standalone presentation. Uh, although it is related to what we were discussing yesterday in terms of the <coughs> radical subjectivity and contemporary Indian art practice. Now, you would notice that, you, I don't know whether Kavita has noticed, that the title that I'm showing now is different. No, that is because this was the title I had suggested to this uh, Bombay Museum, Dr. Baudaji Lard Museum, when they in, uh, invited me to make a presentation of my choice. So I had actually uh, 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 suggested that Cure Phobia, whatever that uh, title, which now I am replacing it, the replaced title that I gave to the my uh, because they objected to the Cure Phobia uh, title itself. I am actually starting the presentation with the phobia uh, that happened in the lecture also, in the titling also. So nothing they wanted, anything, no, nothing controversial they wanted. So. They do want the, the use of the term QR in the title. A or Q, QR, all these things are problematic. So I retitled it as uh, Concerning a Radical Subject Position in Contemporary Indian Art, the Problematic of Exhibiting Deviant Scenes in Art. This is a more explanatory, more, what do you call, not many people would understand what deviancy would mean. Whereas QR or gay would evoke a response. Uh, it's only, I should, uh, uh, we should accept the fact that it's only academic institutions which can tolerate discussions around these issues. Otherwise, uh, no other public um, places or spaces would allow uh, use of those terms that easily, you know. So there is a certain uh, limitation that one has to be careful about. So, <clears throat> No, this is the uh, title that I had suggested to Baudaji Lard Museum and they accepted it. And it is a revised presentation that I am presenting here today. I uh, start with a quote uh, by Barbara Smith. There is a further elaboration of, of this, myth, this quote as we go ahead. Some of these terms may be new to some of you at least. So you, you should stop me and ask for an explanation if you are not following. Please feel free to ask. Stop. Uh, the quote is that in a heterosexist uh, system, all non-heterosexuals are deviants and are, op are oppressed. This is a very generalized uh, observation that Barbara Smith, a queer theoretician, theoretician makes. In a, in a heterosexual is actually the man woman um, polar uh, uh, you know gender and uh, sexual uh, divisions that is made so, so heterosexuality heterosexist all these are terms that are used for mainstream sexual behavior in a heterosexist system all non heterosexuals that is non heterosexuals would mean Queer, LG, L, L, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex. I wish uh, Arun was here. Is he here? No. Sorry. I, he had not been attending the lectures. I wonder why. He, it would have been uh, somewhat connecting to his concern. So, uh, non-heterosexuals are con considered as deviants and so are they oppressed. So that is a statement that comes. Now I, now, I will come back to that quote and that whole discussion about uh, it, but I want to start from uh, the very beginning of what we were discussing yesterday with regard to radical subject position. So that is where this lecture would connect with yesterday's uh, lecture. In, the term, in terms of that we try to define radical subject position or radical position in relation to art practice. So, radical impulse is, uh, is uh, surely related to or affect the fundamental nature of the given available system. Any radical intervention would mean that you are trying to affect the existing status quo or existing system. 
so uh, it is it surely is a notion much more than avant-garde much more than um, uh, you know progressive it is a term that has a potency to challenge the establishment in such a way and also a possibility for praxis in the marxian sense of the term praxis that is a practice that has a po possibility for reflection self reflection and improvement so uh, now i have here a, a, a quote from uh, bertolt uh, brecht uh, who was a very radical uh, theater person i'm just quoting it because it is very useful for our understanding of what radical would mean art is not a mirror held up to reality this is actually the uh, in the context of simulacra also we discuss this uh, uh, art as a mirror held against nature a platonian view of that he is uh, breath says that art is not a mirror held up against uh, held up to reality uh, but a hammer with which to shape it you know you uh, so means that artists need to kind of uh, do intervention very severe kind of intervention in the society to make it change in some ways so artists having an agency this is the word that i used yesterday also in the context of radical practice so breath believed that to be a radical and revolutionary artist to be a defiant that is to say that you have to challenge all the existing norms uh, of any imposition uh, of form or content by any economic system artistic academy or political status uh, so that is a extended definition that uh, breath that uh, gives uh to his definition of uh, uh <clears throat> so now if that is the kind of uh, broad understanding of what we mean by radicalism or any revolution in the contemporary sense that artists this this has also to do with what i was talking about uh uh, uh joseph boys and various movements that came after pop art in the west right Uh, Germany or America, so the artists were coming together to change this political or social system. So, art and activism is a, another terminology that is very common in today's parlance. Now, I want to reflect back to, on Indian modernity, and that is where the context of our presentation today. Uh, so, I would actually argue. This is actually I would like to quote myself here. In the sense, I felt very happy writing this much uh, one sentence. That is tamed, absorbed, and conventional. The profession of modern art making in India is primarily conditioned by the norms set by the institutional underpinnings and structuration, with a very few exceptions. In the sense that it is a very systemic practice. It is not a Uh, uh, it's not a practice outside the system that has been established as far as india is concerned so our pedagogy to be sitting in the art institution we are also thinking about pedagogy there is a greater chance for discussing pedagogy and curriculum etc tomorrow uh, in the lalit kala book release function but today just as uh, i'm only uh, yesterday also i was only referring to the indian art pedagogy right from the colonial times uh, the, 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 it had a kind of historical role as far as india is concerned the development modern indian modern art in india had largely been a result of institutionalized art school education undoubtedly and this in itself is a stark contrast to the western european development of modern art history because most of the things that happened out was challenging the established uh, new uh the 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 neoclassical or uh, victorian art schools neoclassical art schools right so of uh, uh, that has, that had been propagating naturalism and uh, thing so uh, this is in itself a stark contrast this uh, uh, our history is a contrast to the contrast to the to the western uh, modernism as i pointed out earlier also in the subcontinent art developed as part of a protective civilizational project of nationalist discourse 
I mean, whether it was pre-independence or post-independence, starting with early, late 19th century or early 20th century, it had been always a civilizational discourse in the sense of civilizing people or educating people in terms of Indianness and Indian identity, nationalism. Nation is actually one of the most important, uh, you know. Uh, so, <clears throat> one of the critiques that, of course, I will bring out tomorrow in an elaborate way would be that how art schools are producing skill-based and formalistic art making. Very little attention is given to the conceptual, thematic uh, content, uh, whether it is in Chantiketa in Baroda or in Richur. That is actually the national characteristic of art education. Now, I have already shown you these two slides yesterday, one by Bendre and another, another by Shango Chaudhary as classical example of this art school uh, pedagogy and uh, art making. So. Most of the students followed the footsteps as instructed by the teachers, what is abstraction, what is, you know, which way you can make modern art. So art schools had been didactic and uh, canonical, surely. Uh, it did not even develop that kind of a discourse uh, like in the case of Bauhaus. Bauhaus happens in the heart of modernism, but Bauhaus had a different uh, set of, uh, you know, pro proposition towards art education. However, from 1980s through the present times, so, so this is a given situation in the in the country uh, right through today's century. Despite this, from 1980s onwards, you find a range of new ideological concerns emerge in the art making practices. So this is very evident that there are no institutions actually teaching uh, new media art or installation art or this art or that art or it is also not uh, giving courses in uh, feminist art or feminist movement or queer art or Dalit art or any of these uh, newer developments or radicalism itself is not the sub subject that is taught in the classroom here in as far as in our art, art colleges are concerned. Maximum could be a course in art and activism that is actually in an institution like uh, Ambedkar University or JNU that it may be tolerated in some way, right? But need to critically, so we need to critically read the art practice from the premise of radical subject formations from the early mid. So I am actually making a very stark difference, a stark demarcation between the pedagogical practice and the art college practices and also other, and other radical positions that came up. Although we say that radicals, most of them were trained in Trandum school, uh, their position, at least in the case of the leader like uh, Gepi Krishna Kumar, was more uh, uh, was reflecting on an international kind of art uh, making practice. And what they imagined actually its social role was some, somewhat radical in its uh, nature. <coughs> So in all these uh, 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 art pedagogical practices, you don't hear actually what feminism says or uh, what queer uh, people are saying, what we can actually put together as uh, minors in the society, minoritarian discourses. So whereas in social sciences and humanities, uh, things have changed very drastically. That is also because fine art somehow remain alienated outside the uh, uh, larger humanities and social sciences, and it is that's why it's called fine art, very refined kind of. Uh, so it actually makes its own space, uh, a space that is sealed off from any outside influence in that sense. So if there is a change in the uh, uh, larger uh, humanities discipline. It is not reflected so much in uh, art field. I mean, good or bad, I don't know. I'm just making an observation. So within social, but these movements are present in the social spaces and as offered by public, are also in, in seen in public places. They explore unprecedented possibilities of empowerment and formations of radical subject positions. Some may be taken as a fad, but uh, like uh, 
public kissing, as far as Kerala is concerned, one art, one event. No, we don't call it art event, but it was a performative event, so to say. So, from the point of view of art uh, event, right? So, uh, so these radical activities do come about in the social space, but do not find much of an institutional support in that sense. So, they still remain in the in the in the area of. Uh, uh, an an uh, anonymous uh, social space called public space. In a way, I have discussed this matter to uh, 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 art uh, pedagogues like uh, K. G. Subramaniam or uh, 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 Ghulam Ahmad Sheikh. They all said that uh, art institutions cannot accommodate uh, or nurture or uh, encourage radical impulse. This was one disagreement that uh, Ghulam Sheikh had with radicals. He actually was very angry in the radical exhibition. Through the catalogue, he was very, very critical of that. That is also reflecting back upon that. My question was about why he did that. So his uh, response was that, Shiji, in the art institutions, we cannot toy with the idea of radical possibilities, somehow or the other. No, I don't know. Uh, we must discuss this possibility as we go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> so the institution often stood against any radical impulse. Uh, one of the reasons that I am thrown out of the Faculty of Fine Arts is also because amongst the colleagues also I was a kind of a standing out. Because I, I was one, uh, somebody who talked about sexuality, talked about feminism, talked about uh, the social formations or post-Godra, post-Gujarat uh, uh, violence against minors. So we did act on activism as a, uh, as a national conference in Baroda. We did art and minority discourses uh, in art history department. So all these were very, very, very disturbing to the discipline of art history as well as those who held the discipline very sacrosanct in a very sacrosanct manner, you know. So, uh, uh, so uh, I'm actually not was intent, not intending to kind of bring myself in here, but my own practice was kind of questioned within, from within the faculty for its uh, edges, for its uh, uh, challenge. So this will, we will, we are now going to kind of look at uh, the prospects of the queer in the Indian context. Now, the cultural domain or uh, culture in general in Indian families, Indian society in general is about, uh, is, is about uh, conformity rather than uh, resistance or subversion or and all those things would be called as perversity. You know, one of the words that uh, commonly popular, commonly said about being queer is that, uh, first of all, it is then considered as one's choice that you are choosing to be gay, kind of argument comes. Then next argument would be that you are being vulgar and perverse. It is a vulgar practice. It's a, it's a non, uh, they don't know, use the word heteronormative practice, but they use it as perverse. That is somewhat of a mental disorder. It is still actually working in that. So, <clears throat> so if actually radical subjectivity is bringing in these uh, elements into practice, then it is subversion, perversity, and uh, resistance. So art will be marked as a area of uh, uh, domain of cultural difference rather than cultural conformity. Now, it is also very important for us to know before in going into queer phobia as to what queer means. Queer is actually a slang, a negative category that is to be uh, called, uh, it was a name calling of the deviant person. There are a lot of names, such you know, abusive names that used to be used, uh, that are still used. 
in the Indian context as well as in the Western context. Queer is one such word, it means very unusual, very weird, you know, absolutely unacceptable kind of uh, person. Doesn't feel fit in with the heteronormative norms. So the contemporary international activist context of queer assumes an unprecedented positive assertion against that derogatory sense. So the moment uh, it has been assumed as a positive value by the queer people, yeah, you call us queer. And so that is how the term as a resistance, as a movement of resistance, this word came to be used. And then of course, then later on, of course, much before that, the LGBTQ, uh, not Q, LGBT uh, movement had started from the 70s onwards, simultaneous to the uh, feminist movement after the Stonewall uh, incident in, in the late 60s in, um, in America and also elsewhere. Till then, all these uh, gay, bisexual, lesbian, etc. were called as deviants and were uh, considered as a mental or medical uh, problem through the 19th century. Foucault very elaborately talks about all that. Now, that is the identitarian uh, titles like gay, lesbian, um, bisexual. These are specific identities, transgender, etc. Whereas queer is a unifying uh, umbrella term that covers all deviants, sexual and gender minorities. Sexual is one, that is sexual choice of one, one sexual choice. Uh, uh, gender is actually the uh, uh, norm of male and female, but there are all kinds of intermediary gender um, uh, categories, intersex, you know, uh, two transgenders, etc., etc. Uh, so, uh, so this cure is actually a convenient term, and it is there is a very important theoretician, Judith Butler, who uh, theorizes uh, uh, human sexuality and gender roles in the 90s, uh, 1990s and brings with this wonderful idea that the difference that you see between male and female is only a social construct. What you call as femininity and masculinity is only socially communicated thing or socially educated thing. Otherwise, or everybody, there is no specific essential quality of being a man or a woman. We can generally say that they, are, they, they, they have. And also it has been proved today that the difference between man and mas man and woman in actual physiological sense is also very thin. You know? So that it's, com it's considered a fluidity of the sort. Uh, it, the, the hard and fast definition of man and masculine and woman and womanly are misnomers as far as the theoretical understanding of it is. It has not reached the, actually the to the uh, people at large, still actually uh, people consider that feminine is actually born with your body, you know. On the other hand, feminine is actually thought to be, uh, uh, you are taught to become a woman in the process of uh, cultural orientations. So it's an, uh, I was saying that queer is an umbrella term uh, which designates people who are gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, pansexual, transgender, transsexual, intersexual, each of these terms actually, or gender queer. It's, it's apart from queer as such, but gender queer, or any other non heterosexual sexuality and sexual anatomy, body anatomy, or gender identity. So it includes every uh, variations possible within. So, uh, there is a question as then what is the importance of the identitarian uh, labels like uh, all these. Well, that is a theoretical question and uh, it is still maintained, both are used simultaneously for various purposes. When it comes to specific identification as gay, lesbian, bisexual, etc., it is required for a certain assertion of one's choice. Now, the term gay itself is actually somewhat new. It's a liber liberational term, whereas the medical or scientific term is homosexual. Now, 
Once you move away from that uh, pathologizing of uh, homosexuality into a liberational politics, the term that comes to be used is uh, gay. Okay? If a person actually identifies himself as uh, homosexual, then that person would be called as gay. Uh, that is the difference. Uh, so, queer also includes asexual people, autosexual people, uh, so it's a wide ranging, uh, it is inclusive, constantly kind of inclusive. inclusive. So, queer includes gender normative heterosexuals also, whose sexual orientations or activities place them outside the heterosexual mainstream, including people who are interested in what is called bondage, um, you know, BDSM. That is uh, 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 kind of underground practices of bondage and uh, servitude and uh, you know uh, master slave kind of uh, performance that uh, uh, people do uh, in heterosexuals also it, when it happens that will be called as uh, queer. Uh, so queer is a term that is uh, preferred terminologically by activists all over the world. Your culture and practice uh, refers to culture and practices refer to uh, commonly shared cultural production done by shared by all those who are uh, identify themselves as within the queer category. Uh, now, uh, having defined queer, we talk about queerphobia. What is queerphobia? It is an irrational fear and aversion or intolerance or of non-heterosexual orientation and practices of behavior. Anything non-heterosexual, anything society defines as male and female, this is a heterosexual norm. Anything, any behavior outside that actually gives you a kind of a nervous response. Something very, you know, uh, uh, dangerous, you know, something very disturbing. If you see a Hijra, if you see a transgender on in a public place, you feel very un, uh, uncomfortable about its experience of most of the heterosexual people, including gays, uh, queer people. I mean, they are not exception from the social various social norms. So the assumption is that heterosexuality is the only acceptable social orientation and the gender orientation. You have to be either man or a woman. That's why Judith Butler says that it is fatal, it is dangerous to identify to be a man or, a, or as a woman because uh, it kind of divides things into black and white. It actually kind of makes mm, mm, uh, it is big, 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 good. Uh, so, uh, hetero, uh, so heteronormativity is actually a, a kind of very hard and fast uh, thing. Uh, <clears throat> so heterosexuality becomes only the acceptable sexual orientation. Pure phobia is based on prejudice. Definitely, phobia is based on prejudice, similar to racism, xenophobia, that is for hatred to uh, towards Islam, uh, anti-Semitism and structural patriarchy and sexism. These are all comparable uh, uh, concepts or similar kind of concepts uh, which we need to... Now, uh, geophobia is experienced by a queer person in various ways. Uh, there is no stipulated uh, specific way. It ranges from cracking jokes uh, directed against the non-heteronormative non sexual uh, uh, behavior, that is the last part has gone out of the frame, sorry. It actually uh, also leads to violence and killing. A lot of uh, transgender people are subject to violence and killing uh, for whatever reasons, you know. Or gay men have been always um, uh, beaten up or etc. etc. in this public place. പറയാൻ പറ്റും <laughs> 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 
Vaigridam. Perversity is Vaigridam. It's a preposterous concept, it's a presumption. Uh, you know, a negative value used against sexual minorities. It's, that's the easiest response that anybody can give. That you don't know, not the Vaigrida. Uh, and it arises out of the common sense notions of normal and natural. So you always go around with an idea what is normal and what is natural to uh, in human behavior. So perversity is read as a deliberate resistance to guidance of order. That you are born as a man, why are you behaving like a woman? You know, if you are born as a woman, you behave like a woman. You know, what is expected to be a normal behavior. So derived from the heterosexist notion of subjective determinism of the individual against the superior guidance and order. So they, they, they seem to kind of behave in, against the order of uh, the authority. That is why mostly the QA people cannot adjust themselves within the uh, given systems. They are always kind of tra troublemakers. Yeah. Or they are always perceived as tra troublemakers. So the specific way the term is articulated reflects the painful and vicious injustice of naming non heteronormative practices as you have other words like instead of uh, vaigrudam, you call it abnormal. It is, there is a certain sense of unnatural. So there is also a notion of nature, natural and deviation, uh, queer and aberration. These reflect actually the, the kind of social no norms. I mean, our own uh, Nivedita Menon, uh, uh, who, who hails from Kerala, uh, but teaches in JNU, has also faced a lot of problem in the new regime. Uh, her work on sexuality <coughs> uh, brings out that the assumption is that normal sexual behavior springs from nature, that it is understood as natural for a woman to behave like a woman. You know, so we expect a womanliness from, from a woman and a man to be man in that sense. And this is, this is, this, that it has nothing to do with culture or history. So we almost say it as if, as, if, as the nature grows, so the sexuality grows. So, uh, but it is actually cultural determinant. It is actually social, historically constructed. So, Indian femininity, sense of femininity is different from the African uh, femininity. It's simple, right? The Japanese sense of femininity is absolutely different from uh, uh, the Caucasian sense of femininity. And it also changes from time to time. What is a Victorian feminine is not the contemporary feminine, right? So, that also means that it had been constantly a kind of a historical construction. And, uh, but if you recognize that sexuality is located in culture, that sexuality is actually the culturing of one person, that of educating oneself. We have to deal with the uncomfortable idea that sexuality is a human construct. Sexuality or gender is a, some of the uh, uh, physical factors, apart physical factors, it's a human construct and not something that happens naturally, quote unquote naturally. Now, this is from an uh, argument from an uh, article by her, Section 377, How Natural is no no Normal. Uh, so this was actually the whole uh, 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 struggle against the reactionary uh, Pindripen uh, uh, law, 377, you know, in IPC. Now it has been repealed. You know, that has been removed. So, this is actually half a time, 2007, when people were struggling to remove that particular uh, 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 unnaturalness of sex, and that was punishable in the, in the law, in the eyes of law. So, Derrida actually says, Jacques Derrida says that there is no nature as far as human life is concerned, only the effects of nature, that is, de naturalization or naturalization. In fact, actually, we are, no one is natural. Everybody is actually, all behavior, human behavior is cultured and educated. So it is actually denaturalizing. 
the child in becoming something right so uh, so naturalizing into the human behavior in the socially accepted uh, so that is actually the kind of uh, I need to kind of uh, tell you about what cure is and what cure phobia is in order to understand the phobia uh, in art is concerned now QR is actually as I mentioned Foucault says that it's a term of uh, degradation has been turned into an affirmative set of meanings through speech act he actually uses the word speech act this is a very useful uh, terminology for art interpretation at least for me it meant a lot to find that an artist is actually engaged in speech act now Judith Butler calls this radical resignification and in a famous very famous book bodies that matter in 1993 uh, and what is uh, produced is speech act is is a discourse which carries the discursive power that is uh, what a gay uh, queer person is doing in the society leads to a kind of a discursive uh, uh, discursive uh, uh, power uh, to to change the society so through the speech act you know it is not activism in the sense of uh, 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 you know, catching somebody and changing that person but making art feminist art or gay art or Dalit art would mean actually that society would have to interact with it and create a kind of a the, so these are called speech acts and uh, would call discursive which will have the discursive power uh, to, 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 to create new discourses. Denaturalization and naturalization happens due to discursive practices. So most of our um, improvement in life, progress in life happens because of uh, discursive practices how they converge or confront as forces and as accumulated effect at a historical point in time and work as restra restraining or as enabling practice is what is of relevance in the present context. So we are actually concerned about its social effect. We are actually thinking about your practices, but how does it affect the society? How does it change the perception? How does it help to kind of uh, people to change? Yeah, so we have already discussed this point. Now we would be interrogating the normative binary categories like conformity, subversion, normal, perverse. Now th this has actually become a little redundant to talk. Uh, historically relate this to your activism. So my purpose of uh, bringing in all this concept is to relate to uh, your activism and high art practices, drawing on specific examples. I would try to understand the indistinguishable and rather close the uh, closeted relation between queer activism. So now a very important point to be noted is that, that as an art historian, what I faced was that art is art. You have to see it as art with capital A. Why do you bring in that aspect of activism here, right? So or it is also the same with uh, feminism, feminist art. No, uh, so uh, uh, whatever may be your identity as an artist, what counts is what you're making as art, right? So uh, so interrelationship between queer activism and art had to be argued because artists themselves are sometimes not identifying them themselves as activists, especially say somebody like Bhupan Thakkar who did not want to kind of identify himself as an activist. He said that I am not an activist. I'm a painter. No, so that is actually because he wanted to ascertain his, uh, uh, his own uh, role as in the society as a painter, and he has his role as a painter. You know, so uh, this presentation uh, in this uh, context that we are discussing will try to see as to how mainstream art world accommodates, sometimes accommodates tolerate or even make provision for the unacceptable through assuming certain strategies of appropriation. Now this word we have discussed. How they include it and silence it. How they, so my job is actually pull it back from this assumption and then make it speak again. 
to its audience. So, uh, so the mainstream is constantly kind of making uh, the, 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 the silencing act because they, have, they are playing games there. Now, uh, deviancy, what I call as the outburst of bizarre in Bhupan Kakkar, is the difference Kakkar's gay closure make to art world. What exactly, I would ask this question, what exactly is the difference that he makes to the art world? Does it make any difference at all? Or it was a very, very insignificant something that he did. But anyway, it is important because he was a very insignificant artist as such. Significant differences take off in his painting for sure. Uh, in Hucker's works by early to mid 1980s, thematically and in the delineation of pictorial spaces. This is one such example, old man and young man, uh, in an angelic uh, man, young man, uh, giving life to a almost dead old man. So there is also that, uh, Two men in Banaras painting, where a young man and an old man actually are in communion. Now, here actually in the 90s, he moves into a much larger, much greater uh, perversity, so to say, quote unquote, you know, deviancy. Now, this is a very uh, funny title it has an old man from Vasat who had five penises suffered from runny nose. Now, Maybe you have felt already normalized with it by now. But first time I saw it, I felt like laughing. I didn't know what to do with it. Like, you know, it was very funny uh, that a man with five penises uh, having a runny nose and seated like that, you know, showing off his uh, uh, penis like that. It was unusual in the world art, I would say. Anywhere, uh, you will not find an imagination of that kind. Now, certain things have to be taken into consideration when we talk about Pankaka. He was a self-taught painter. He was the first Indian painter to use the popular uh, mass uh, sensibility in, in his art. He assumed strategies that could flaunt the mainstream through performances in the 60s. Playful, odd and unusual pictorial delineations that he brought in. He is the first uh, pop, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, collage painter. Uh, uh, so, and also he brings narrativity like that, like in the case of the old man and the young man uh, with the donkey. You, know, you cannot please all kind of parable kind of thing. First Indian artist to have disclosed his homosexual orientation through painting, it is also Bhupan Kaka. So, in many ways, he is uh, significant. But bizarre is something very bizarre in Bhupan's work. Uh, uh, Bhupan had very quirky imagination, very unusual imagination, which his colleagues like Sheikh or Jairam Patel or Jyoti Bhatt or none of other people shared this bizarreness. It could be only attributed to his sexuality, according to me. And the enigmatic, uncanny and unprecedented freedom of imagination that uh, Bhupan enjoyed and his ability to bring it all up in the canvas. He did not really control it in that sense. So it is very much of a sub subconscious mind that he allowed to work in his work. Or very figurative kind of translations like um, when Danalu uh, saying, Asanatila Baram Pavnaduru Tanalao. Uh, so it grows from the arts, that is the title. Probably he used to come to Kerala. The saying probably he has uh, lifted from the local source, you know. Or maybe it is also in Gujarati, I don't know. But anyway, so uh, it is about uh, this shamelessness that, uh, the theme is actually shamelessness, uh, that. And of course his orgy, his uh, two men, uh, you know, his words actually become a little more problematic because uh, the relationship that you find between these men are not, you don't know they are love making or hating each other or killing each other or they don't know. Because that is what you observed in his life. I mean, in the, in the gay parlance also. Because it's the most systematically unsystematic community. You know, you can't change them. That is what they are. They are very unpredictable. In, if you are in a 
gay party or in a gay collective or something like that, people are so absolutely, you know, bitching about each other and gossip and you know, kind of uh, weirdness that actually happens. The intimacy of the body turns into some bitterness so soon. I mean, it's very difficult actually. It comes through in uh, Open's uh, short stories also. His collection of short stories, if you, some of you should read, it kind of brings out that uncanniness about experiences that comes. You know, you meeting somebody on the road, you are sleeping with that person, and uh, immediately you think that, I mean, uh, that it's just a one night stand, you know? And after that, there doesn't exist anything. So, there is a narration of that kind that Bhupen engages with, you know, uh, 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 in his work, in his writing. So, simultaneously, you have to see that. So, it is that, it is in that sense that he celebrates himself, saying that I cannot please all, you cannot please all. So, I have already talked to you about this particular painting yesterday, so I won't do it. But there are some very figurative works like. Uh, title. This is a small watercolor work called the uh, In the Closet because In the Closet is actually a, in the gay context. It is said that somebody who has not disclosed his identity as a gay man. You live in the heterosexual marriage and double life, etc., etc. But this actually figuring a man, a middle-aged man, sitting inside a cupboard. You know, in a literal sense, uh, it, this needs to be kind of interpreted in many, many, many ways. His wish to kind of bind his uh, lovers. He had many lovers, and uh, some of his lovers came and also kind of exploited him in terms of money, etc. So somehow to lock them back into into the closet, uh, perhaps. You know, uh, this is that particular work that I talked about. Yeah, this is the kind of uh, reality that he comes to by early late 80s and 90s that the indeterminacy of uh, pictorial language, you know, that you don't know whether people uh, there are making love or hate or fighting or there's a kind of a relationship that is very enigmatic, so to say. But there are also this kind of things like uh, next day morning, two men waking up in the morning and wearing their clothes to return back home. Or uh, looking at man's heart, which has a male uh, image there. It's like uh, uh, the image of uh, Hanuman, you know, picturing Sri Rama inside, right? Now, we can't actually say it in front of the RSS guys. Definitely they would <laughs> take uh, violence out of it. But of course, here uh, the, the, he's picturing a man's heart. So early instance of uh, body being pierced by images. Uh, it's a 1999. Earlier to that, uh, perhaps uh, Surendra Nair did. So also Sheikh did in his representation of uh, 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 Kabir, etc. So that is another story that we need to kind of be very carefully study and understand. How many hands do I need to declare my love? So, love you cannot establish as well as since there is no institution that binds two men or two women. So, each time every uh, uh, the question of love comes, it's about based on doubt. That are you committed to me? Will you be committed to me? Kind of question that comes, right? So that is, uh, the, in a very comical sense, in a farcical sense, the title is, How many hands do I need to declare my love to you? So he uses uh, Hindu iconography here with multiple hands, etc., etc. So those things are also there. Or oh, funniest, one of the funniest uh, paintings is that uh, there's nothing like 50th, 30th wedding anniversary for two men. But he pictures them in a kind of very funny way, you know. Uh, so perf perfectly, his own persona is uh, uh, there. Uh, one person is kind of uh, playing the role of female. So that is uh, Sakhi Bhav. There is also this painting called Sakhi Bhav. I am not showing that, which is also a uh, practice in Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, uh, where the the the, uh, the 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 priest has to dress up like a female. 
one of the thing is about covering the head with a veil so cockers coming out of the closet and thereafter coincides with the gay liberation movement this is a very important point to be taken it is not all of a sudden that he comes out in the 50s or 40s that uh, uh, so it did not exist in the 40s or 70s you know it happens in the 80s <clears throat> so he's coming out of the closet coincides with the international gay politics uh, and also a major step in one's uh, assuming one's identity uh, <clears throat> perhaps his uh, bizarre in Bhuvan Kakkar's work uh, comes out of his unresolved perception of being a gay the self-doubt that you often may have the wonderment and uh, unbelievability about one's own sexuality in disclosure. Thank you. Now, in any case, uh, there is a playfulness that you find in a, a wise man uh, like Rupan Gakkar. There is also a palpable pleasure that you find. Uh, so here we come to uh, Kakkar's Radical Speech Act. Now, despite the fact that Kakar constantly rejected his activist uh, label to be called on him, uh, he's from the premise of the marginality. I, I, I am arguing that. Uh, uh, one from the gay identitarian politics and that of playing out an unusual, queer subjectivity. Now, <clears throat> he was an already an established artist. That is a, one of the important aspects that what we need to also keep in mind. He was already written about by important uh, art historians, including Arvita Kapoor. Uh, uh, so, and his role in the making of uh, modern Indian art, right? His, especially his interest in popular art and also popular life as an artist of the... So, uh, <laughs> now, so, uh, he was an established artist, he was accepted artist, so it gave, these were kind of very important for him. Uh, 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 one of the important aspects is that through 70s he used to go to London and that is, he himself confesses that, that that's where he has seen gay men living together. So international gay liberation movement and its impact was visible internationally. And this has actually made uh, uh, a major impact on him, especially its manifestation in life and art in the 80s. Like David Hockney was very well established at that time in London. Right? And also you were thinking about Francis Bacon uh, in relation to his sexuality. Uh, apart from, of course, uh, other artists who were in the, in the, in the field. Uh, he reflected back on his 70s and 60s work as ribbon packages, ribbon packages that is very well neatly packaged uh, themes that he was painting. So he himself was a critic of his uh, uh, painting in calling it as a, some of those these words. But nobody doubted actually the lonely man there, you know, that was mostly he, his desire for the other uh, older man. Even in the Shankar Bhai in, in front of the uh, Red Fort was never considered uh, or never guessed, anybody guessed his uh, closeted expression of his uh, sexual desire. Or whenever he painted men, mostly they were, uh, uh, you know, singular men uh, in a very tragic kind of uh, guys throughout his 70s that you find. So, uh, so he worked away from that mode of, uh, you know, packaging, ribbon packages and worked out a, a kind of a bizarre in his work that was, I'm calling it bizarre, he never called it bizarre. Uh, uh, to my, to my, me, it appealed as a very bizarre kind of uh, explosion of his sexual uh, themes. Uh, <clears throat> importantly, this shift over coincided with this uh, gay uh, identity disclosure, drawing courage from the international gay liberation movement. So, no, I'm, I'm actually trying to say that uh, the authoritarian heteronormative 
art criticism in the country do not want to recognize this shift over. This role that was played by his liberational uh, politics in writing on him. So I will give some examples here. Art world sidelined or overlooked his gay disclosure. They always hushed it up put it in a some kind of inconspicuous place. Like I remember first time seeing uh, this painting, uh, Two Men in Banaras, in one architect's uh, 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 current grower's uh, studio in al -Kapuri. It was not shown in public place. So it was hushed up and shown in private space. Even in NGMA, wherever, whenever he had a show, some works, which were uh, problematic were kept inside in an ante room, which were not allowed. The argument was that children also would see them, right? <laughs> so, but it was actually to keep out from the general uh, public's, uh, you know, outcry. So, uh, the, the, the hetero normative art criticism uh, uh, talked about uh, critical, uh, in, uh, critically about its formalism and historicized his value and worth and contribution. The question uh, whether his sexuality played any central role in his making of art was overtly overlooked by almost all uh, art historians. <clears throat> uh, I, on the other hand, I would argue that sexuality played a very, very important basis. Basic uh, content of his art is almost uh, like a political assertion, speech act of Pupendukka, I would say. Now, uh, those who considered his speech act or activism as a limiting framework, uh, you have one uh, art critic like Ranjit Haskote, who says that within the generic confines of, no, he says that it is limiting that Kakkar be framed within the generic confines of gay politics. He considers uh, looking at uh, gay politics, because our true gay politics would be a uh, limiting factor. He argues that critics who claim him exclusively for gay politics cage him in a limiting position. Now, it is a very questionable uh, statement that he does, uh, he makes in this uh, largish article that he writes for uh, Atul Dodia's show, which will come to later. So it's not a, to say gay man's life and art as a, definitely don't want to see a gay man's life and expression as a political matter, but as a private concern. This is one of the most important things. That's his private thing. If he's gay, that is his private thing. Why do you have to talk about it? So, but on the other hand, he himself was coming out in public as a gay man and wanted to be accepted as a gay man. So. Uh, so, one of the most important for gay politics is that coming out of the closet, which Pupan Kakkar did. Now, Gita Kapoor writing about Kakkar talks about essentializing a, a gay man, Indian middle class homosexual. He doesn't even use the word gay there. He uses a medical term like uh, homosexual, which is not at all a political terminology. Celebrating the oddity, awkwardness, tragic, and sentimentalizing informs the entire body of his. Uh, so, very reductive reading of what a gay man is. You know, he typifies this gay man in the middle class, uh, dilapidated, surreptitious, uh, going double, living double life, etc., etc. He, she has not seeing gay men living independently or with his partner or uh, her partner, you know, completely overlooks it. It's kind of a heteronormative, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, position. Now, his, uh, so that is the entire Gita Kapoor's uh, writing on uh, Kakkar actually do not accept his uh, gay agency, agency speech act. Gay politics cage him in limiting position is in fact primary, primary condition, I would argue, condition that helped Kakkar to take his first major step towards asserting freedom from the constraints imposed by heterosexist norm. Coming out of the closet was actually his major first step. Uh, 
So there is an embarrassment in acknowledging that connection between uh, gay disclosure and uh, uh, his importance as an artist. So I am arguing that this comes from queerphobia. This is a very subtle form of ignorance, ignoring the uh, activist role. Uh, that should see an artist like Hakka within gay politics as a limiting factor. On the other hand, it is the gay politics that gave him the ultimate freedom to be an artist. So what derives uh, special attention here is that, uh, uh, the mind, uh, that we should be understanding that Kakha's minoritarian political movement is the fact that Kakha became the first Indian artist to have disclosed his identity as a homosexual. And this crucially, uh, this is crucially absent in the significance of Kakha, both in Kakha as well as, uh, sorry, Kapoor as well as in Haskote. So it is actually reducing it to the kind of private uh, thing. Oh, Rupal Kakha by chance was uh, gay kind of thing. Now, this kind of uh, uh, phobia is reflected in uh, uh, other forms of censorship. Uh, the main uh, mistreatment of uh, Kakka's works by National Gallery of Modern Art, I already pointed out, in 1997. And Mumbai, there was a retrospective show in 2003. In both these, actually, uh, Geeta Kapoor here criticizes the curator. It's very interesting that in the Bombay curator is criticized. The museum's act of censorship show the intention of providing a conservative, consensus-driven view rather than highlighting the changes and challenges to the status quo. So here actually she is kind of bringing up, her own writing actually shows a kind of another uh, approach. Uh, so uh, so uh, in the Bombay show, uh, uh, Kakas, uh, two men in Benares was excluded, Ram Bhakt Hanuman was excluded, picture taken on 30th uh, wedding anniversary was avoided. So many important gay works were uh, not kept because of the censorship and the Bombay you know, public's uh, anger. So uh, spectatorship and politics of representing Bhupen, you have artists responding to Bhupen, like this is this is Chitish Kalat's photograph titled as three a tree with five penises. You can read it uh, on your own. I am not going to explain it. This juxtaposition itself is um, telling, right? This was a, a, a commemorative exhibition of Bhupendra one year after his death, or so. Yeah, 2003 he passed away, and 2004 on his death anniversary. I mean, what is this funny tree, you know? I mean, how it says simply he could identify it as uh, five penises, you know, of a, of a tree. Or Altaf, with all our respect to this uh, uh, socialist communist artist in Bombay, is no more. Uh, man with five cigarettes. And so, instead of, so I feel that that particular work has evoked the maximum negativity, negative reaction, funny. So this was one exhibition uh, in uh, Kimold. Uh, this was celebrating uh, open and friends. Now, so this is actually the problem. Now, when you talk about friends, it is his uh, immediate uh, uh, friends who had been painters like uh, Gulam Sheikh, uh, it would be Vivan Sundaram, uh, Nalini Malani, as if they have, they know everything about Bhupen. They should decide the value of uh, this thing. Or it is a gesture of kind of some sort. But in any case, it is not. Uh, then Vivan, of course, had his own uh, uh, one-man show on the basis of Bhupen's drawing, bad drawing for, for those. Th that was the title. Now he plays around this. Uh, he, 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 he plays with Bhupen's drawing and then stitches on it, on the butter paper, and drawing behind. So some of these, uh, again, you find these five penises. Now there is that actually a valva kind of uh, form there, uh, in the middle of the, uh, which uh, Bhupen is not actually showing. There's an addition that uh, 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 may not be a, a, a you know, vagina, 
but it's maybe a, uh, what the gay would use uh, for sexual pleasure, you know, uh, what is generally called as uh, the, how do you put it, kundan. Kundan is the word that is used here, right? So it actually means the uh, ars fakar, right? So ars is actually kind of a very important organ in the body uh, for a gay man. Is juxtaposed, overlaid here. So it's not only really penis that Pupin should have actually kind of showed his ass. So it's some kind of shaming that is involved here. It's not Pupin's own wish right here. So uh, being a those you, you can privatize and make joke of his uh, sexuality and life. So um, Seva is another very important work by him. So it is actually putting it back into the religious realm of that, uh, you know, kind. Uh, I'm not going into that. This was I mean, another major show by Atul Doria. Uh, uh, Shri Kakkar Prasanna is the title of the show. It's showing off all kinds of technical skills, but I'm just pulling out those which are very problematic words. This is uh, Shri Kakkar Sok. Instead of saying Shri Kakkar Kok, uh, which is um, the you know dildo kind of uh, thing there glass box with velvet cushions and so there is an obsession about uh, sexual organs, male sexual organ for a gay man, undoubtedly that we should be able to accept, acknowledge it, right, and respect it rather than making fun of it. So uh, private, that friendship and privacy leading to kind of make, making jokes about, this is actually a very common practice and moreover, I mean, his multiple partners, Pupin's multiple partners are made into look like uh, some kind of advertisement by Atul Dodia. That Hira Bai as a concrete, uh, no, one is, uh, can you read it? Estate agent or, uh, yeah, uh, laminators, Red Short G as a, so these were, these were different men who played a significant role in Kapka's life. They are ordinary men, like this uh, Shankar Bai, this is the same Shankar Bai in front of the Red Fort. So, <laughs> so for Maika, uh, San Maika, so this is a kind of trivializing that is being done in the name of friendship, making poking fun at uh, a man, you know, who represents something else actually. So it is a kind of mistaken identity because Bhupan himself lend himself to friendships of that kind, you know, without that kind of uh, putting his foot down and saying. But he allowed everybody to have fun with, about him, enjoyed himself. Now, uh, that is Bhupan Dakar in a way to his friends, you know. We may have uh, occasion to discuss about him further. But I want to bring in certain other dimension to gay politics in India. So you have a very important fee film that came in 1997, which was very hugely attacked. Mira Mukherjee, Mira Nair's uh, movie, Fire, which was the first uh, Indian movie to address the two women's uh, sexual relationship in a family context. This was opposed very strongly. It was a serious movie. Uh, it may have its own limitations, but another entertainment that was created is Dostana. Uh, so, uh, people are kind of waiting for creating a kind of mirth and joke and, you know, uh, playfulness because they themselves are closeted people who are making or directing the films, what's the So, they can only make fun at uh, this kind of, uh, uh, and a very important film that came out on gay thematics is uh, My Brother Nikki. It was done by Oni is a Bengali uh, filmmaker living in uh, Bombay. Uh, to relationship between two men and one was a sportsman. Actually it is based on the real incident in Goa. The first uh, HIV positive uh, uh, person uh, in India and the kind of treatment that was uh, given to him and how his, uh, bro, his sister stands by him. Yeah, so I just wanted to contrast these two approaches. So, our film industry, how uh, 
Juhi Chawla plays this very wonderful role of the sister. Actually, the story is narrated from the sister's point of view. If some of you have not seen this uh, movie, it is less uh, prominent. Please uh, see it. It's a very sensitive movie. Now, I want to kind of shift to another thing <coughs> that Barbara Smith's uh, quote that I gave in the beginning. Homophobia is usually the last oppression to be mentioned. Uh, compared to other oppressions, last to be taken seriously, last to go also. It is constantly there, but it's, it is extremely serious sometimes to the point of fatal. Homophobia is in and of itself a very verifiable oppression and in a heterosexist system, all non-heterosexuals are viewed as deviants and are oppressed. The full uh, reference uh, details are here. So uh, the first part of the uh, quote is more important that it is a, the last to be mentioned and the last to go. Homophobia is the last to be mentioned and last to go because it's not something that significant. Unlike the feminist issues or Dalit issues, uh, I would say. Uh, so uh, she argues that um, homophobia, uh, uh, homo, uh, homophobic uh, abuse is a tacit uh, uh, attitude. People don't realize that they are abusing their uh, friendship or their, you know, power as artists. In contrast uh, uh, to Bhopan Gatkar, as I mentioned, Bhopan was the one single solitary figure there in the in the 80s who came out of the closet and became a kind of gay icon, one would say. But next generation of artists uh, like Jahangir Jani, again not trained, but comes from a, uh, Sunil Gupta, Balbir Krishnan, etc. actually comes from activist background. Now what do you see? Right? So they are activists and they want their art to be activists, you know. But they realize actually the limitation within that, you know, within activism. So we'll come to that. This is Bhupan Kakka. But now uh, uh, this is uh, Indar Salim. Uh, he secretly sends uh, this picture to me and I take this liberty to show it to you. That's my politics, right? Uh, now, you, do you read K uh, iconography here, do you get theme here? Yes, definitely. But it is not something that he exhibits. The cellular camp here. Uh, yes, yeah, so there is an aspect of in him about his sexuality which is very deviant, but that is not the central theme that he actually brings in. He, he has, he is an activist artist definitely, but he sidelines his sexuality and talks about politics more in terms of state and his Kashmiri identity, Hindu-Muslim identity, all those are very valuable, uh, valid points also. Now, this is just a reference to Indian Penal Court section 377. Uh, it reads, whoever voluntarily has sex against the order of nature with man, woman or animal shall be punished with imprisonment of for life or with imprisonment of either uh, dis description for a term which may be extended to 10 years. So this was, this is the law that was repealed in, uh, when was it, uh, 2009 uh, nine or so. Okay, <laughs> so there's a big quote from Michel Foucault here. I don't want to kind of, uh, it only says that uh, in the context of homophobia, he simply says that uh, uh, the, 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 the scene of uh, two men holding their hand together, getting into a room and finishing it off, nobody has any problem about. Probably everybody knows or everybody does it that some kind of license is given to sexual relationship. But he says very pointedly that the problem begins when they make an alternative lifestyle. They begin living together and challenge the familial expectation of not wanting to get married to a woman. So this, that would actually challenge the family. Uh, so I thought this quote was very applicable as far as Indian situation is concerned. Because the worst suffering phobia, that uh, oppression that uh, gay men and gay women uh, suffers in is the family system in India and family expectation. How to hurt people through coming out. 
you know, is the major uh, problem. So, what actually upsets the Indian system is uh, not sexual act. It's not the sexual act or pleasuring of two or men or two women together, but it's actually trying to create an alternative system, alternative uh, that challenges the heterosexual system. Now, it is in this context that uh, uh, that uh, queer movement begins its uh, social presence, that queer uh, parades are very common in big cities in Kerala also. Uh, 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 this is uh, 19, 2009, but it started already in the... So, uh, also early publications in 1990, like Bombay Dose, this was a secret publication from Amsafa um, Trust, uh, Ashok Rao Kavi's uh, established in Bombay. Uh, there were a number of uh, gay uh, collectives that were formed in the 90s, through 90s, even today. They are the ones who formed as a pressure group to repel 377. Now they were also arguing for marriage rights, adoption rights, inheritance rights, etc. etc. So legally, probably it will be moving ahead, but still social values uh, don't change that easily. Now, it is in this context that we need to look at, uh, you know, Bhupin I am once again actually sharing that with you. But Bombay, uh, those magazine also carried, because they also had the advantage of HIV uh, fight. A lot of these voluntary organizations in India came up in the context of not cultural activism, but medical activism. Because there is a period of HIV uh, disease. So a lot of money was put into these private um, NGOs for uh, empowering people. So these are uh, 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 some of the magazine covers of Bombay Dost. Uh, this one is actually uh, Jahangir Jani's uh, stamp uh, of, I think, uh, uh, India at uh, 1950, uh, 50 years of Indian, Indian independence, where you have Bharat and Bharat being played up. Uh, the, the love sign also you can see there. Uh, so this were also this is also my part of my documentation. The pamphlets, leaflets that are circulated. Mm, also, uh, along with the gay film and uh, gay organizations that came up, publications like Yarana collection of first Indian uh, homosexual uh, uh, short stories collected. And also a historical study of uh, references to deviant uh, sexuality from the tradition, from Vedic times onwards, by Ju with Ruth Venita and Salim Kidwai, published in 2001. These are very path-breaking uh, uh, publications. We, they also bring out that it existed in, in the ancient past, also brings it out in terms of uh, 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 cultural representations, uh, uh, lesbian, uh, lovers in Khajuraho, gay lovers in um, uh, Khajuraho. So the whole of medieval, medieval period you have such uh, representations. You know, it existed in Indian society. The argument that uh, India it is a Western import, that's just a kind of argument from the right wing often, that it's a Western thing, uh, that you are imitating West. Uh, but whereas in India we have the all range of your uh, people. Uh, uh, now, there is a very important observation Hoshang Marchand, a poet, uh, the poet, a gay poet, uh, talks about. In H India's Hindu culture, which is a shame culture rather than a guilt culture, the uh, Judai Christian cultures are uh, guilt, they, they give a certain punishment and uh, this thing. Whereas in Indian uh, Hindu culture, it is about shame treats homosexual practice with secrecy but not with malice. Many educated Indians confuse homosexual with a eunuch. There is a lack of uh, understanding or knowledge. They think homosexuals lack sexual organs or cannot sustain erections. Many homosexuals are forced to live with eunuchs if not become eunuchs through castration. A lot of, uh, lot of, lot of uh, work needs to be done with regard to the subjectivities of these people. I'm just showing you out of the blue one ex example of a video work. These are stills of a video work by Tejal Shah 
It was titled as Chungu Chingari Chumma. It's hardly ever shown in public. This is actually uh, a lesbian woman who uh, dresses up as a man, uh, uh, as a villain, and then uh, uh, kind of uh, silences a, another man. And uh, he, she makes a comment, kind of a, uh, 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 parody of the Hindi movie where the hero comes in the you know cheek and stuff like that to save. So the the oppressor actually wants to kind of gives the kind of uh, she wears a dildo and performs for uh, uh, to asking the man to. So this uh, this uh, uh, video was never ever shown in public because of the fear. So this is actually because it is oppressed, suppressed because of the fear of uh, 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 attack. Uh, but it was shown in the education institution in Baroda in one of our seminars and uh, it was interesting to see people's reaction in that. You know, uh, I was more observing the reaction of the people, embarrassment, didn't know where to look at uh, and uh, why all this, you know, kind of thing is not, you know. So anyway, whether it is good or bad, I'm not uh, judging that. That is a matter of discussion. What is the limit that you can draw for a uh, queer uh, representation um, is a question. Um, so Jahangir Jani is an Engar artist, as I mentioned. He is also a self-taught artist. He had been also in Bombay um, uh, Hamsafa Trust. Added a, he was compelled to add a fig leaf to his sculpture, Great Expectations. After Mumbai cops uh, asked him to cover the obscene part, so censorship that uh, hits uh, 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 art exhibition. This was uh, also objected to because of its male nudity, and he withdrew this sculpture. He was compelled to withdraw this sculpture from the exhibition, and instead a photograph was exhibited. Now he clarified. To, uh, he, to me in a personal correspondence that to be classified as a gay artist is a disadvantage, he says, compared to being an artist of uh, mainstream. Specific disadvantages of being an artist, he explains to me, uh, quote here, you are well aware that I have been unoffic uh, unofficially kept in the margins of the mainstream uh, art world. Largely because I am vociferous when it comes to not kosher to speak terms of sexuality. I was advised by my gallery as well as writers and fellow artists to downplay my concerns. So this is a kind of response that um, also comes out of his uh, you know, experience with the cops about exhibiting public exhibition. But more actually kind of uh, how a gay man can participate in a group exhibition and how he can be discouraged by the gallery or the writers. Uh, O'Neill, whose film uh, uh, stills that we saw, uh, My Brother Nikhil, uh, uh, believes that it will be almost impossible for new voices in the arts to surface among the LGBTQ community. Because uh, he says that young people who are dealing with issues of their sexual identity will be discouraged to come out. Getting new people exploring their sexuality through art will become that much more difficult. So it, it is very uh, true that uh, young uh, people who have their sexual identity already known but would like to kind of underplay it for various reasons. So from a, with the experience of Belbir Krishnan, who is physically disabled also, uh, uh, his exhibitions are systematically destroyed. Uh, by the uh, in uh, 2011, first time he was exhibiting in Lalit Kala Academy, Delhi. After many threat calls he received, Balbir was hit by a masked uh, attacker and his uh, works were vandalized in the gallery. Uh, the exhibition was titled as Out Here and Now in uh, 2011. I was there in Delhi at that time. The, uh, the phone call referred to IPC 377 and also uh, this thing, this, this is not allowed as far as India is concerned. So he had a lot of nudity in it, uh, male nudity. So this was not allowed. They, this, this, like this one, was uh, questionable. So.
so then after that he tried to work on another exhibition in hyderabad he was invited to show in a uh, <coughs> marriott hotel a gallery <coughs> exhibition by belbir at the muse gallery marriott hotel in hyderabad was closed in 2013 december before it started it opened because it the recalls and fear uh, caused this and he writes um, in a press release that this is a setback to me professionally financially and emotionally i feel brutalized all over again and it brings back memories of when my work of uh, artworks were vandalized and i was physically attacked at my second solo exhibition at the lalit kala academy uh, in 2012 uh i spent the last two years trying to build my confidence and to push myself artistically today i feel uh like i am back to square one i know i will bounce back but it will take some time i will stand tall and proud as i always have and continue forward with my work and in my beliefs in artistic freedom of expression no matter what <coughs> further he says that what hurts me most perhaps was that it was not even consulted before the show was taken down he was not even informed that the show was being cancelled uh this is uh, uh cowardish uh, censorship combined with cowardice he says right so now after that what happens to uh, belbir belbir finds a american lover he migrates he goes to america he lives there He has a permanent uh, partner now. He works there. Life is comfortable. This is happening in India since 60s, uh, since independence. Uh, whoever felt that they are different sexually migrated abroad, went to Canada, went to America, went to London, because it was difficult for anybody to live here. So, Rajkumar uh, Machen to Salim Kidwai to many others had. Been, uh, they 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 studied there or they worked there. They tried to remain there as long as they they could. So also Malayali writer Krishna Bhattacharya, who has written his autobiography, uh, being a homosexual uh, gay. What's his name? What's his name? Krishna. Uh, he is uh, engineer kind of person. Uh, I don't remember the name. yeah he also goes abroad to gather his uh, strength to speak so this is an exhibition by sunil gupta i'm not showing more works by him because it's not a complete exposure to gay art in india but this exhibition which was inaugurated in uh, 2012 at alliance france in delhi was closed abruptly due to the intimidation from the police quoting the violation of section 188 and uh, 292 at the uh, obscene content and the disobedience to order is the this thing this is this is a particular photo graphic uh, uh, portfolio that he showed a uh, very different kind of portfolio uh, not the usual kind of portfolio that sunil uh, was doing sunil gupta as such was uh, brought up abroad canada and america and also studied in so later on in 2002 he came to india to live in india so for a, more than a decade he lives in india and works in india uh, so this are this is about an indian boy going into a paris uh, you know uh, club gay club and the surprises and the kind of uh, account encounters that he faces is uh, brought out in the in this particular Uh, <coughs> series of works that he does. So this was the, the work was also the works were also brought down. There are obvious uh, 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 representations of uh, uh, sexual identity in the case of uh, uh, Sunil Gupta, which was very very carefully displayed in private galleries in India. Uh, uh, Shivam Beach is a he is a Uh, nigah uh, statement uh, condemning the shutting down of sunil gupta's exhibition sun city and other stories in uh, uh, he wrote in kafila 
is moral policing of queer lives is now nothing new. Charges of obscenity have been leveled against us on things ranging from pride marches to plays, uh, movies and writings that allude to queerness. Homophobia hides behind these meaningless and arbitrary charges and as queer people we are expected to be shamed into silence. Queer lives and desires are most, more not shameful. Moral policing is. So this is uh, a response. I am showing a very young artist, uh, not so very young artist now. He did this in 2009. He has also not exhibited anywhere. Uh, this was a Ramesh Pitya. He takes his own photographs, self photographs, uh, like in this, and asks, what is your perversion? Is the you know, poster on the other side? So a kind of challenging question that he puts across. He also brings up uh, medieval instances of homosexuality uh, and asks this very simple direct question like, is anal sex uh, legal? Uh, is a question that he writes on one side. Then I will show you some details of this uh, uh, large work actually represents, uh, drawn from medieval examples of uh, Persian art, um, showing um, man in having intercourse with another man. Uh, also, it's not very good uh, um, slide, but just give you some idea of now, I would like to end my presentation with uh, Jordi, Judith Albastam, uh, who is my favorite uh, feminist uh, cure writer, and who has written this uh, book called The Cure Art of Failure. So failure is not really, I mean, she, according to her uh, writing, cure, failure is not something that uh, should discourage us. Under certain circumstances, failing, losing, forgetting, unmaking, undoing, unbecoming, <laughs> Not knowing may, in fact, offer more creative, more cooperative, more uh, surprising ways of being in this world. So that's why I call my Facebook page as Art of Failure. It is from this that it comes. I would like to acknowledge that here yeah, because often people do not go into the reading of why something is titled like that. Uh, failing is something cure. Uh, do have and always done exceptionally well. Failing is uh, something viewers have faced and have always been done exceptionally well by the others. For viewers, failure can be a style to cite um, Quentin Crisp uh, on on a way of life or a way of life to cite Foucault. Or it's a way of life. It's, that's what she says. Failure and survival is a way of life. Uh, or to cite Foucault, uh, it can stand in contrast to the grim sensory, uh, scenarios of success that depend upon trying and trying again. In fact, if success requires so much of effort, then maybe failure is easier in the long run and offers different rewards. So I would like to end with this and I would like to say that my project at this point used to write a book on failed art in India. You know, I don't, I'm not interested in getting the successful uh, artists, you know, so-called gallery success, so-called represented in national gallery or in, uh, you know, international galleries. But those who have uh, not exhibited, those who have suffered mainstream, uh, uh, you know, uh, discriminations, all those who works were vandalized for various reasons. We have lost those art, some, some fragments may be existing. So this is one project that I am interested in and which would also link it to what I was talking about, my critique of the mainstream, of the difficulty of subjectivity as well as India is concerned in the context of. This will also have the aspect of uh, so I'm actually kind of, in, through the six lectures, I've been trying to project my own future project uh, of a book, uh, uh, which may happen or which may not happen. If it will depend on the kind of motivation that I will be able to draw from my day to day. Because otherwise, I'm quite uh, uh, arrived, quite uh, done my work, and can, can gladly retire from all that. So. <laughs>
Thank you very much for uh, the absolute uh, attention uh, to what all I have to say. Uh, my articulation is not so well. I have to depend on these projections. I stammer sometimes. I, I mean, I stop. I mean, my, 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 I wish I, I had better flow or better uh, way of talking, uh, a better way of reaching out. Like some people like this uh, Sunil Nilaydam, you know, gives me complex. <laughs> I am very jealous of him. <laughs> he is excellent in his application. Absolute uh, mastery of uh, speech. Uh, I am not so educated, so uh, well educated. So my, I have limitations. So thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk all, to all of you. And thank you once again Manoj and Kavita for coordinating things. Uh, with this I actually finishing the sixth program except for the last uh, discussion which we may engage with. And of course some of the tomorrow's uh, presentation is in continuation to this only what we are talking good, talked about. So thank you very much. Uh, Any questions we would like to address right on the basis of this discussion? Socially acceptable values becomes norms. Man should be like this, woman should be like this, you should not do this, you should do that. There are certain set of things, right? That is a norm. Heteronorm means heterosexual. Heterosexuality is not like Homosexuality is not male, male, female, it is a relation. Uh, mainstream uh, sexual orientation. That is the norm. So, our parayna heteronormative values. Our parayna itla, our vishwaskina itla, karingalana heteronormative. So, that is the standard uh, acceptable, accepted uh, uh, belief system. Right? Uh, but that is why when somebody is saying somebody is an intersex or a bisex or indeterminate sex or somebody like Arun who has a kind of sexual identity of a particular kind, you know, so all that becomes very unacceptable. That doesn't fit in the heteronormative, uh, uh, you know, this thing. Then they say that it is perversity. Yo, oh, boy can actually become a man, you know. He need not actually play his uh, you know, identity that way, right? So there is also this case of sportswoman, no? Mm. He, she claimed to be a woman, but the doctor said that he's a man or something like that. So it went to the court, you know? It goes into that kind of, in the controversy. But her feeling about herself and her uh, physicality except shows that she is uh, female to her. To her, she is female, but her uh, bodily, she may. That's why there is a lot of people who enter into sex change, you know, become, you know, transfer themselves as females or as become males. You know, because if they are born in a wrong body, if your soul is in a wrong body, uh, then you will be compelled to kind of uh, change yourself. In the olden days, they, they, there used to be a very crude practice of cutting off one's penis and becoming a man. Or in certain societies, there was uh, completely asexualizing uh, women. Like, uh, you know, that is also a practice because they don't hunt for sexual pleasure. So they can be kept as objects, you know, for sexual pleasure or for domestic, whatever. Their clitoris would be cut off, you know like male circumcision, female circumcision. So various kind of such traditional practices existed uh, to convert people from nature to what was born to something what you want to become or what others want to become. So today the transsexual can actually get better options in the medical science. But if you land up in a wrong hospital or wrong doctor, you will be exploited. Then and you have a lot of cases of uh, suicide. In Kerala itself, you have a series of such events, right? Happening more recently. So they are very cruelly kind of treated.
teacher uh, in the society. If you are a boy today, and if you want to become a female, and then that stigma will always be attached to you, right? Uh, so thank you for asking that question. I suppose I made a little more sense to you. It's a vast area. You should read, uh, as and when you've grown up to understand things, you should read Judith Butler, uh, Gender Trouble. That is the book name. I quoted from him. Uh, that is not necessarily a BA level book, but of course, if you want to have a more uh, updated understanding of <coughs> sexuality and gender, you have to read uh, that understanding by Judith Butler who says that it's fatal to be man or woman. And I'm very happy that uh, Nilima she quotes it in a, in a painting. <laughs> I know, because uh, her work can be often taken as a very effeminate, feminine kind of thing. But it's more actually about her attitude, you know. A certain identification with the kind of femininity is good, I would say. I would prefer that to a macho masculinity, whether it's from man or a woman. Ma woman can also assume a kind of a, a mat matureness, no? Matriarch, you know, kind of a, a equally worse of a patriarch is a matriarch also, right? So, uh, but fact is that both male and female has all these possibilities between them. They can behave like a man, they can behave like a woman also. It's your choice. Uh, Gender, gender roles gender. is a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's a very, very specialized, complex issue, as well as uh, gender studies are yeah. concerned. Uh, yeah. So, but it has advanced a lot more than what used to be in the 60s, 1960s or 70s, because of the LGBTQ movement on one hand, feminist movement that has come up. Writers like Foucault, Judith Butler, and a whole lot of other writers, like whom I quoted, Art of Failure. All of them have uh, contributed <coughs> to our understanding of these uh, complex issues. Any special studies based on uh, sexuality, gender, 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 like uh, mm -hmm. uh, Judith Butler, uh, queer feminists, etc. Et so, feminism plays a very important role, surely. Make that point. There's another speaker. Sir. All right. Any other question? Quickly. Sir, what is speech act in the this is what actually Foucault calls uh, any cultural expression. See, it comes from the situation that it comes from the fact that an artist is an artist and an art is an artist. Artist's job is to do art, right? Artist is not an activist. I mean, they could be an artist like Joseph Baez, who, uh, who was very wise for this about what he did, and he was good in articulating his position, etc., etc. But very rarely, we want artists, most of the artists we find are into themselves, into their studios, you know, or into their work in a very central way. So what they are involved in is articulating thoughts, right, regarding equally as the theoreticians whom we talked about, the feminist theoreticians, your theoreticians, artists are also engaged in these issues, you know, in their own language, in their own materials, in their own ways, right? So uh, each of their um, presentation is a speech act. It is in that sense that she uses the speech act. <coughs> but articulation is just a self-expression. But speech act means that they are socially communicating. It's actually some kind of public speech kind of thing. That they have something to tell the world. Mm -hmm. That they are not spelling it out in terms of a uh, dialogue, in terms of written statement or something, right? 
but it's uh, um, the sheer fact that uh, Bhupan Dhakkar in our case has did so much in his art for self-expression and in a way he is expressing itself for the, for the entire uh, gay community, for the sake of whole entire community, you know. So uh, he is articulating their anxieties, their problems, their issues when he titles himself as uh, 30th wedding anniversary, something which doesn't exist, you know. I mean, when heterosexuals can easily celebrate 50th wedding anniversary, you have to, your love is never uh, recognized or accepted by the lover himself, right? Because often the lover may be a married man. In the case of Bhupan, definitely that was his uh, situation. So they have to always go back to their uh, wives, live double life, etc. There is a very funny category called bisexual. There is no bisexual in, in terms of real true sense. But they all call themselves bisexual because they can happily engage with both uh, male and female. You know? So that is, uh, uh, that is the Indian situation. But there is another word that is used that is uh, men having sex with men. That is MSM category. Actually, this most of the um, uh, NGOs, okay, uh, HIV, HIV activists are involved with uh, these uh, MSM men. Because if uh, gay men are kind of practicing, it will be in the gay community. But uh, these MSM men are engaged in a kind of dangerous, uh, you know, sexual activity. It will actually get into their families, to their children, to the, you know, whoever they have sex with. So, this category became very prominent in the context of uh, health activism, this category. But that is the truth about Indian uh, homosexuality, you know, because everybody has to get married. Uh, that is the kind of norm that is set and it is highly uh, pressurizing, you know. It's very difficult because often the village people don't even have the terminology to talk about it or understand it. In what way will I uh, tell my parents that I'm gay? For you it is very easy to say it's gay, I'm gay, you know. So if I say that I have sex with men, I mean one thing is that sex as a word itself is very, you know, stigmatic as well as Indian families are concerned, you know. So then they have some very typical derogatory word, you know. If you are a North Indian you will say Gandu. Right? which is considered to be a very uh, derogatory sense. Your son is a gandu. Huh? Or even if you use a word like kundan in, in the Kerala, Malayalam context, you know, it will be very, very tough, you know. No decent person will say that word, right? I am just quoting it here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I had organized it in the area. It's okay. I know. Many people use that word in a kind of very negative sense you know, to demean you, to put you down. Anjita, you are Anjita, right? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, what I got to ask you that uh, is it even gender studies, uh, is it really helping the public and even cure community LGBTQ uh, and the people more aware about them? Is it really helping nowadays? So education generally is to help us to grow. Mm -hmm. Please have a good, clear understanding of it. Education is not just learning some techniques and some, you know, technology. Right? Technology is important. Techniques are important for you to make painting or art or whatever. <coughs> but your thinking should develop. You know? That is very important. So where else to look for? When, you come, when it comes to understanding gender, you will refer to gender studies, right? So those who have contributed there, the, I quoted Nivedita Menon, who is in a sociologist, gender studies, etc. Right? Uh, many people like, uh, comes from literature or other areas. So gender study, your question is actually whether gender studies help. Does economics help? <laughs> Does history help? How do you judge that? No? So it is actually specialized learning in the master's, PhD level, that they become actually professors, 
I mean, can you expect another professor talking like this with this subject? No, right? So it is actually our personal orientations that make us go into our direction. No? We choose after MA in the level of PhD, what we want to do, or even after PhD, what we want to do. How do you want to make an effect in the, in the discourse of your discipline, right? So, uh, yeah, education is basically to progress, to get more knowledge, to change the social, you know, limitations that we face in the life. So I don't want to live an oppressed life. I don't want to kind of listen to somebody say negative things about what I consider positive to me, right? So, education helps. Right? Gender studies definitely and for particularly women who are all oppressed people, uh, particularly women, to come out of their, to make an understanding of their situation. You should know what is patriarchy, what is Indian family system, to liberate yourself. Right? Liberation is not a bad thing. Right? So if you want to liberate, you want to live a life according to you. what you think is right, then you should study. Then there is no other way. Whether it is gender studies, whether it is, whether it is history, whether it is sociology, whatever that may be. So our education is not just for getting a degree or for learning some techniques, but also to make us grow as human beings. That is why it is called university education. You may not be feeling that in a place like this, but in MS University you feel that it's a university, it's part of the finance faculty, it's part of the university. It also it means, it means universal knowledge. Universities are uh, uh, and cultivating universal knowledge. So, uh, whereas these institutions where you are studying is a technical institution, it has come, come out of a technical institution, British period technical institution. So, it has its own inherent limitation, I would say. So, uh, that cannot be the measuring road. There can be still enlightenment here. Uh, there can be still knowledge here because you are living in a society. That's why I brought in Sunil Elida, you know. Uh, because if you just Google search, you listen to him in the uh, YouTube, you get so much knowledge about history, about uh, religion, about uh, sociology, about so many things. So, I don't know, I'm always over explaining things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because your question, I don't know from where it comes from, so maybe my answer will have some, some. Sir, BDSM practitioners mentioned it, I don't know, I don't know. Bondage and the full form in the approval or more nila, approval or more nila. It is actually to do with, uh, a, um, it, pract it is practiced in uh, gay community more, BDSM, right? Bondage, dominance, slave master, slave -master relationship. Because uh, some mm, people find uh, uh, satisfaction in being treated as a slave for whatever psychological reason. So they like to be in bondage. Uh, I will take uh, names here, but Robert Mathram Mapplethorpe, this photographer, American photographer, gay photographer in the 60s and 70s, has represented this subculture in photographs. So please Google searches. Uh, so there is one called Grace and Perry. Uh, now he is active in the UK. Mm -hmm. He has been written a, a Yeah, yeah. It's also about survival. No, I have known one person in Baroda. He's an old man. He was old then when I was younger. 
So his desire was, uh, he used to practice also, to have men in his life whom he can treat well, that who will treat him, discriminate him. He would like to cook for them, he would like to, you know, do everything for them in like a traditional woman would do, you know, wait for him, he'll treat him, you know. So kind of a performative space that they, the closed doors. Outside he is a normal any like any other man. So this is a kind of subculture that one is talking about, right? So these are very closeted kind of things. These are very secret kind of things. Uh, sexuality as such is not a very openly discussed theme in that sense. You know? uh, uh, what happens in a gay relationship, what happens in the bed. Whereas more or less it is clear that man, woman, uh, what they do in the bed. Okay? Depending on their class, their education, their exposure, etc., you can expect what they would do. Uh, I cannot be more obvious about it, obviously, because you are in the classroom, uh, but it is understood. But the sexual behavior of a non heteronormative uh, person is very, very flexible, very fluid. It changes from time to time also. Today one would like to play a, but tomorrow one may not. Some people go out in public as a cross-dressed. They may be male, as born, identified as male. It's very cross-dresses. Very stresses ah. are very important to see items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go around in the parties and uh, socializing, etc. Cross-dressed. But once he is back into his work, he is like a uh, man. Quite normal. <laughs> so double life uh, in a certain way. So you need actually that. So these are very um, specialized, uh, specific, specific practices. Do we know what uh, transgender uh, this uh, people do in their privacy? No, no. You only know them clapping their hands in the outside, right? What are their rituals? What are their social patterns? What is their uh, uh, interpersonal relation between Guru Chela and all that? You know? There are subgroups, etc., etc. Uh, there are sisters there also, sister bonding, mother, sister, mother, daughter bonding. A lot of those, uh, I have not studied deeply, but you can... These days, such people are opening up, opening up to us, actually. One day, somebody came here uh, about the group. I mean, friendship groups. Uh, they just asked me to But what uh, But what she told us the way she made the mix. Uh, heterosexual, uh, kind of life, uh, the way she mimics a heterosexual family kind of life. Mimics, actually. So such mimicries are also happening in their lives. Uh, and Vijay used to tell us so much about uh, what happens within their circles and all. She has an adopted mother. I mean, she adopts the mother. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, brothers also. Not, not brothers, sorry, sisters. Uh, she, uh, she has some sisterhood, some secret sisterhood. But still, she married a um, small looking, I mean, not so tall as him. Uh, guy uh, who is a Muslim and that marriage was another scandal. So you can't expect anything from him. Yeah, very flexible, very fluid kind of life. Right? So a lot of things um, uh, they don't easily disclose also because that is their internal life. Uh, very few studies are done. Very few studies are done. Um, regarding these uh, subcultures and more personal matters, so-called personal matters, right? It's very difficult to inquire all that. And also because to me it is, I'm an art historian I'm, and I'm looking around for materials that are related to art. In what way it can help something and help me in interpreting art would be my question, right? Not life as such. You know? Varied kind of lives that you see. Their life will, will have some importance in their, some reflections in their works also, right? So the major problem I find is from your uh, uh, comments on that is 
we can't understand movement because we don't understand that kind of a life uh, properly and we can't uh, get used to it and understand from a human perspective normal uh, yeah, that's why we, his, we have to understand his speech act huh. what is it based on where does it come from because there are congregations that he had been visiting of gays in a particular festival etc etc so all these war gays and all that that he represents are come from that you do you know Trichur Puram is infamous for all the gays to make uh, contacts you know? I mean I don't know whether it's an open secret I mean many, many gays uh, gay friends have invited me to come here for Puram so that's because they do certain kind of uh, festivities uh, uh, of, uh, you know, collective practices, etc. Et so, yeah, so a lot of things are not known outside the world and to the world, and it's only an academic interest that makes us interested in it. But it interests me because I can interpret something, you know. <coughs> Probably uh, we'll be continuing the afternoon session, but before that, uh, just to say a word of thanks. Uh, uh, I actually, these were, I think, a wonderful session of talks, uh, mostly because uh, uh, it was enlightening, and also sometimes I felt it took some very poetic turn that I noticed you emphasized on failure, the aspect of failure. That was really kind of, you know, we can ponder upon later. And also, uh, it was very interesting that uh, uh, after presenting about the new media practices, uh, when you came to this Italian trans song, uh, I just enjoyed the session and, uh, you know, the reinvention or your sort of interpretation um, and the possibilities in art making, that was uh, really uh, interesting. And this final session about the cure and LGBTQ. That's also very relevant. And uh, uh, my apology uh, that uh, we couldn't give a uh, decent honorarium, that is because of uh, how this uh, <laughs> bureaucratic <laughs> hurdles. So but my friend was asking, are you getting a lap today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I was. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. I wish I could have bargain like a great art you know, work will demand so much, yeah. great presentation should demand so much. So it's not an, op yeah. it's not an open market. So to summons are also <laughs> like, uh, maybe uh, hopefully next year uh, things are, things will be sorted out because it's already the draft is on approval on the way of approval. So no, I, I said that it's not even the UGC scale. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so it's okay, that's yeah. not the whole purpose now. What will I do with all the money? I have very limited uh, purpose for money. Uh, because the pleasure that one des derives from doing this, you know, uh, in interacting with all of you, the yeah. students particularly, also sharing ideas and uh, making the youngsters to, uh, to yeah. think about things. And I am uh, particularly, I am uh, uh, fond of uh, Kavita and support Kavita uh, in her attempts in creating a BA in art history here. Uh, so, which is uh, an appreciable uh, act. I mean, we know that there is a center for excellence, how it functions. We know other places uh, in the in the in the in the state, but uh, this lady is the only one who had the willingness to start a uh, program in uh, uh, BA program in uh, art history and visual studies. So, my wholehearted appreciation for that. So that's why the moment I became free from my uh, regular job, I offered her that I could teach, right? So last year, I taught two courses without uh, uh, 
uh, expecting anything back. Uh, it's only kind of a um, supportive yeah. act uh, because a lot of things you do are not just for money, you know. Uh, so thank you for mentioning remuneration, <laughs> but uh, always it's also not possible to stretch oneself and would expect uh, remuneration. I'm not averse to money. But that is not the only. No, I was right on. I was talking about the technicalities involved. Yeah, I know. I understand. Know I know the limitations. Yeah. yeah, I understand the limitations. Yeah. No, that is not a problem. Yeah. But the will to invite, you know, will to kind of sit through your sessions and give a responsive uh, response on the basis of what you were sent is very valuable even um, at this stage in my life. It's not that I don't care or something. Uh, so thank you very much. It's not money that really matters. But also work is actually with pleasure. And pleasure is very important. For us. So thank you very yeah, much. in immense thanks to Dr. Shivji and uh, all the participants. And uh, lastly to uh, Sri Anirudhan, who is the coordinator of the visiting faculty program. Um, he was uh, single-handedly you know, operating uh, you know, in the background. So I would like to say thanks to everyone, uh, Dr. Shivji Panikar. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For coordinating everything, especially for recording and putting it in the YouTube, because whoever wants to refer to it can, can find it uh, there. And also, <laughs> uh, so uh, because whoever wants to refer to it can, at least it is there for everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even for people who have not been able to attend this. Thank you. See you at the conference.